Okay, I think we'll get started. <clears throat> welcome, everybody. So, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Timothy Johnson Medical Scholars Lecture Series. Um, just uh, particularly for our visiting speakers' sake, I'll mention again that Timothy Johnson was one of the founding uh, faculty of the Virginia Tech Carillion School of Medicine, who was very committed to the model of a research intensive medical school. We've named this lecture series in his honor uh, after he passed a couple years ago, so it's a great honor to remember Tim. Uh, it is a great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Ophelia from Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta. Uh, Dr. Ophelia is the Senior Associate Dean of Clinical and Translational Research, Professor of Medicine, and Director of the Clinical Research Center at Morehouse. She also serves as a PI on the NIH Research Center Minority Institution Translational Research Network. I've had the opportunity to work with her uh, at the AAMC on the Advisory Panel for Research. It seems like 10 years. I know. It's been a while. <laughs> And I can say every time uh, Dr. Ophelia comments on anything, it's always uh, something everybody listens to. She's articulate, an effective voice, and I've really enjoyed working with her closely over the years on matters of national urgency for medical research, so it's a great pleasure to have her here today. Uh, she did her medical degree at Amadou Bello University in Samaru uh, in Zaria in Nigeria. I'm sure I screwed up the pronunciation of one of those. And then she did her uh, master's degree in public health at Johns Hopkins. Uh, internal Mes medicine residency in Oklahoma, and then clinical cardiology fellowship at Barnes Jewish at WashU in St. Louis. She's very involved nationally in a lot of issues related to women's health, uh, black uh, individuals' health, and cardiovascular health for those populations, <clears throat> as well as the general population. She's a dedicated and committed researcher, as well as cl clinician and leader. She's been recognized with all kinds of awards. She's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. She's also received <clears throat> the Charles Drew Award for Outstanding Research on Cardiovascular Diseases in Emerging Populations, uh, the Physician of the Year Award from the U.S. Congressional Physicians Advisory Board, uh, and serves on the Board of Directors <clears throat> of the National Space Biomedical Research Institute and the American Board of Internal Medicine. Uh, her research has uh, dealt with issues of defining the appropriate therapeutic levels, doses, interventions for treating cardiovascular disease with special emphasis and care towards the population uh, being treated, including minority populations and, and women, of course. Uh, she has also uh, done work through her NASA affiliation on the effects of microgravity on the vascular system and the effects of uh, uh, zero-G, I guess, would be in sensitivity in space to salt-sensitive and salt-insensitive hypertension along the way. Um, she's been also very involved with uh, innovative approaches with transesophageal echocardiography uh, to study cardiac function, and she is, as I said, uh, involved with major leadership roles um, at Morehouse College of Medicine. In addition to that, I learned at dinner last night because people like Dr. Ophelia always just seem to find something else they do when they're working otherwise 24-7. She set up a foundation in Nigeria uh, that she's very involved with that is helping uh, young girls in high school have opportunities to work in science and putting a lot of effort, I know, in her own blood, sweat, and tears into that. So she's the all-around complete deal, an outstanding physician, scientist, educator, and leader. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Elizabeth Ophelia. Thank you so much, Dr. Friedlander. I have to say, it is truly my honor to be here, and I appreciate the invitation. Um, I, I think I'm supposed to turn this on. Yes, it's on now. And uh, I've really enjoyed, um, I've already always known you and just been impressed by you and the work you do, but just coming here, finding out in, in person just the innovation around this medical school and the research institute, and the amazing research that's going on, and not, of course, the amazing medical students and graduate students. I think you all are very fortunate to have uh, someone who actually is a thought leader in the field um, in looking at the innovations and in, in at least how we train people to do research. So I've enjoyed everyone that I've talked to today so far, and I really am looking forward to having uh, the opportunity to collaborate on, on more than one level uh, with many of the folks here. So my task today, and um, actually I enjoy this sort of thing, but so when I came up with this topic a while back, this was last, I don't know, maybe about a year or a year and a half ago, I was invited to do, to give the, um, I think they call it Wednesday afternoon lecture series by NIH director, which is Dr. Francis Collins. 
And I was excited to be invited, and someone says, well, um, I just want to let you know, the people that give this lecture are usually Nobel laureates. I said, well, seriously? I said, so I'm going to have to come up with something that sounds like it's coming out of a Nobel laureate's mouth. So, <laughs> so I came up with this topic, and everybody says, yeah, that's interesting. And then they asked me, have you patented that title? I said, no, I have not. So I said, you know, maybe it does work. So I'm going to see what you guys think. Each time it's a little bit different because it needs to be based, you know, really focused on what the group needs. And what I thought when I, I spoke to Dr. Freelander was he said, you know, just, just do what you do. Tell them about you and where you've been and what you're doing. So there's a little bit, if you feel like it's getting a little bit schizophrenic, that's because I'm sort of, I kind of flow like that. And don't give me an ICD code. I don't have one yet. Um, but I just find that it's exciting to look at the spectrum of stuff. And that's what you'll see in the lecture. So we'll see how it goes. So these are my disclosures. I do have a patent. Um, it's a system and method for chronic illness care. And what I'll say is the AccuHealth Technologies is a faculty startup. It's still very much a startup, has not made any money. My husband goes, you need to stop this because we're supposed to be retiring and you can't be spending our money doing your faculty startup. But what it is is um, we are you know, really around chronic illness care, as you'll see. We are using some of the technology in some of the research that's going on, not me personally, but at Morehouse School of Medicine. Morehouse sponsored the patent, but they have since released it to the company. So I, will, I need to tell you that because you'll see Health360X is coming out of the, the technology. The other uh, disclosures are I do have some uh, advisory board uh, consulting. I'm not going to be talking about any of the specific therapies related to that during this lecture. So what are the objectives? I uh, would like to um, really begin with what I'm calling a D design. Um, and I know because I, I sort of figured I need to put that in there because I know you guys are part of a big tech university. So I wanted to impress you um, and say, you know, this thing really has the innovation around D design. Basically, from what I understand, it is really, really more around making sure when you're designing stuff, you're thinking about the patient who's uh, you know, the end user, I guess, is a better way to put it. But for me, it's bringing this into the whole issue of uh, in how patient-centered uh, um, approaches need to inspire what we think we're putting up uh, to manage patients. And again, in this case, it's going to be in the context of health equity. I will present data on self-monitoring in type 2 diabetes using a mobile app technology. That's the one I referred to earlier. And I would like to be able to discuss challenges and lessons learned based on behavior change theory for patient engagement. So this is something that I'm sort of getting to learn more about. And, and again, when I met with Dr. Friedlander and listened to some of the innovations that's going on here in neuroscience, it just seems like some of what we're actually doing is really just scratching the surface in terms of some of the aspects of behavior. And I think it will be interesting to share some of that with you guys, and then you can think about, as you engage in research here, how can you take that to the next level? So I want to begin with this. I think that um, some of you may or may not have seen this. This tends to be more common in the public health space. People are now talking about a vision for health equity. And that is really around making sure we were able to understand and differentiate the uh, equality versus equity. Because when we talk about health equity, we're really wanting to make sure everybody understands the fact that it is really about individuals and what they're bringing to the table. Some are maybe not so tall, others are super tall. And if you give everybody the same uh, resource, in this case the boxes, some people will never be able to attain, if in this case having access to a healthy apple is the goal, some people will never get there. But if you look at the equity space, you actually have to understand what people need to provide that to allow everybody to be engaged. Unfortunately, many of us believe that this is a reality where you have sort of oversupply in some instances, and there's no way this is good enough for this guy because you can see he's about to fall into the field and has, you guys are supposed to laugh. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact is, reality is totally just out of proportion. Someone is so isolated here, they cannot participate in the game. 
someone is doing reasonably well, but you know, they really at least have some supply here. And this is oversupplied based on what they need. But you know, so you do have the same number of boxes sometimes. If you use the equality mode, you're still not, you know, some people are still not engaged. I like this picture because what I tell some of my students is, I like to see this on the, on the positive side because I'll say, all three of them are engaged. That means they're learning from each other. They're, they're chatting about the game. They're all providing some support to each other. And it's always better when we can be fully engaged and utilizing all the resources that's available to us. And so I just also wanted to um, put this up here because this is way before you guys' time. Uh, many years ago, uh, back in 2002, uh, the National Academy of Medicine published this um, book called Unequal Treatment. And it was really based on many, many years of research that's really highlighting the fact that we continue to have some significant inequities in health and healthcare. So as a cardiologist, as I engaged some of my colleagues, before this was published by the, because the National Academy of Medicine, uh, IOM is, was previously the name, it's now called National Academy of Medicine. Everybody, in many, I shouldn't say everybody, many people refused in cardiology to acknowledge that they were delivering anything but perfect care. They said they treated everybody exactly the same. And when this data came out, people understood that it is the case that we're not giving the same care. And there seems to be some disparities based on race and ethnicity. So this is just there for the background. And this is why you find me. And because the students were asking me, why did you get into this space? How did you get into this space? And all of that interest. And some of that is, again, I am drawn to the issue of some aspects of um, um, social justice, but in this case, in health and health care. And so I just wanted to um, just uh, put this discussion to bed. I know I heard uh, earlier that you guys did a great job with this in terms of the review of the manuscripts. I just want to mention that uh, for those of you that are thinking about obviously engaging in research, um, this particular student, uh, Baraka Floyd, who is now a pediatrician in practice, she actually did this research when she was a CTS, a what we call a TL scholar, which is a pre-doctoral uh, fellowship where you get some funding support to be able to do research while you're still a medical student or a PhD student. And she did this as part of her MD training. So she's not MD, MSCR and um, is practicing with that. And, and, and I, when I looked her up uh, to pull this manuscript out, she's still publishing, which is a good thing. Um, so I know that Dr. Friedlander and the team are looking uh, to potentially bring a CTSA here. So that's a real opportunity. The other thing I want to point out on this is um, you'll notice here that there's a bunch of people on this slide. And I just mentioned to you, uh, Dr. Strayhorn is actually a family physician who works with our master's uh, program. Guillermo Amperez is an endocrinologist, and of course I'm a cardiologist. This guy is a uh, biostatistician and informatician. So increasingly, it's, it takes this level, sort of a, a team-based approach, and I think those of you that are basic scientists or non-clinicians uh, I know would be pleased to see that. So this other one is a little bit uh, more of my pet issue, and I'm not going to dwell on it, but I just uh, put it up here. This is the other manuscript that was there for you guys. And it's really to remind us that in spite of all of the IOM report, we're still not doing the right thing as far as us as clinicians, not always following evidence-based care. So the hat that I wear, I do a number of things. I talk to a lot of doctors and say, you've got to tell your patients to participate in clinical research because if they don't participate, we're not going to get the right answer for everybody, which means people are going to be treated with drugs we don't even know works in them. And one of the smart graduate students earlier was telling me he doesn't even think that the lab ranges that we use is as relevant to our current population. So I think he's got a bright future. He's going to go out and really do a lot of good things out there. But I think we always should be asking the question, is the norm really the appropriate thing? Is everybody receiving what's appropriate? And based on this study, we found that if people had been treating based on the evidence standard that's out there for heart failure, especially for African Americans, uh, we would be able to save over 7,000 lives each year. 
And that's, uh, I think that's quite sobering. So at the end of the day, there are lots and lots of disparities. And obviously, as a cardiologist, I am sort of in one space here as far as hypertension, heart failure. But I think it's sobering to think about just the broader problem that we see from just early birth, even from in utero, childbirth, and then on and on. And that really brings us some issue about asking the question about what is it that creates health. So this is where my public, hat, my public health hat comes into play here. So I just want to give that disclaimer. It's interesting. Some people in public health think, think I'm a sellout because I'm a, I'm a cardiologist. And I don't think so. And I was telling the students earlier, I actually think public health is good for everybody to understand what it is as a driver in public health, because understanding the driver of public health helps as a clinician and even as a scientist helps you understand what, what it is you're doing and the potential impact from the broader um, uh, community and population. So here we go. In terms of determinants of health, so this is sort of a favorite thing, as I said, in the public health space, because according to the WHO, these are all the things that we need for good health. And if you look at it, and a lot of what many of us spend our time with in health and science and, health and medicine and healthcare is relatively small percentage here in terms of proportions. There's a sizable bit of it, of course, that's behavioral health, and that's going to speak to some of what I talk about in a little bit. But look at the social and economic factors, a big chunk, almost 50%. And then when you look at how we actually do um, healthcare, so here we are, as we talked about the social and economic cir circumstances, behavior and stuff. We wind up spending a very small amount on prevention. And I had the opportunity to meet your chair of family medicine who works with the prevention task force. So I think you guys have an opportunity to maybe reshape this, uh, this landscape. But a lot of our effort is spent on medical services, almost 90% of our dollars in terms of health expenditures. And again, that many people believe that is upside down, and I happen to be one of them. I think we could be doing a lot more in the prevention space and behavioral health management. So that brings us to some of the conversation around design thinking. And again, as I said, I was fascinated. This is really came out of Stanford years ago, but many uh, people who are collaborating with engineers and technology folks and healthcare are starting to look at this. And when you think about this, given what happens in clinical medicine when you're in front of a patient, you're asking them questions, you're trying to take a history to understand what's going on, and you're trying to formulate what you're going to do. But there are now some understanding. We now know a little bit better that there's a little bit of a flaw in how we engage that, at least, in our traditional medicine. And again, I know you guys are doing quite a bit of innovation, so I expect some of this you may already be doing. Um, but what's here is, of course, it's hard to solve a problem, and I think engineers know this very well. Uh, you really need to understand the end user. You need to ask the question, I'm trying to design whatever that uh, tool is. How is this person going to use it? What do they value even before they get to use of it? And of course, designing the problem and talking about it and thinking about the potential strategies and ideas then prototyping and then testing, and then going back over again. So this is a very complex process, and I had a chance to force some of the work that we've done into this process, and it's not easy. But in the end, the whole notion is when you do design thinking, you're actually thinking about the user experience. And I've learned now, especially working in the health uh, technology space, that sometimes you're just going to design stuff and nobody's going to use it, because you never really ask them how, you know, what was important to them in their day-to-day -day life, and I, I'm still wearing my Fitbit, but sometimes Fitbit winds up in the drawer because that's not important in people's day-to-day -day life. But that's, that's a lesson for all of us, as, especially as we engage technology. So I just have a few quotes that I kind of thought was pretty interesting. Um, of course, uh, this is from our favorite genius. Um, he said, if I had an hour to, to solve a problem and my life depended on the solution, I spend the first 55 minutes determining the proper question to ask. For once I know the proper question to ask, I could solve the problem in less than five minutes. I don't think any of us really do that. Just imagine that, when you would just confront a problem and just spend almost the whole hour thinking about that problem and thinking about asking a question 
of that problem before you actually think about the solutions. Many of us, including me, especially in cardiology, we sort of just dive in. And a lot of the times, if you're trying to solve for big issues like what we're dealing with right now nationally, you have to ask questions. You have to engage a community that's involved to think, are you even asking the right question from their perspective? And so this brings me to the power of storytelling. Um, and you'll see some of this in, um, in the data that I share. I, d I think that obviously we know that in medicine because we spend a lot of time with case studies and talking about the case history. Uh, but sometimes I don't think we necessarily listen well. Um, so think about this. If you let the subjects tell their own story and listen for the things that elicit emotion and cause them concern or frustration, so what is it that excites the, the patient or the person that you're trying to design a solution for, the history in this case, you will hear about their concern or frustration. If you want to find out what people really need, you have to forget about your own problems and worry about their lives. I wish I lived this all the time, but I, sometimes I take shortcuts, and it comes from having four children. So the power of storytelling is also the fact that there is data now that if you let people relate their successes and failures, um, that these stories will really bring in some things that govern and organize people's lives and reveal what they find normal, acceptable, and true. Um, and it is interesting, because I heard from Dr. Friedlander about some of the research going on here, some of our assumptions about cultural norms and how cultural norms shape our behavior, what we think is standard versus what we think is totally alien, is just amazing. And again, as I said, I'm just excited with the work going on here. I see a lot of opportunity just in understanding some of these aspects of what works and why some things work and other things do not work. And so I think maybe the young doctors or doctors-to-be will be surprised to find this out. But many of us have come to understand this. People do not always do what you think they do, do not always do what you tell them to do. They almost never do what you tell them to do. They do not always do what they think they're doing. I think your imaging showed that. Um, and they do not always do what they say they do. And so the interesting thing is, this might be saying, well, so what, is a, what is an investigator to do? What is a clinician to do? And this is why asking the question, sort of reading between the lines, seeing where people may not want to reveal too much, but they show some frustration, see what, where they show excitement on the positive side, helps you get to that understanding what people really need. And so this is the um, point that I introduced you to this uh, young woman. And for those of you who've done a little bit of work about HIPAA, you're probably thinking, why are you doing this? It's HIPAA protection and so on. So she happens to be my mom, and she gave me permission uh, to put her up here. Um, so I actually had a, some aha moment when I, I was confronted with the story I'm about to tell you. And it sort of helped me in, first of all, I should say that one of the reasons, because uh, the medical students uh, asked me this earlier, one of the reasons I become more and more involved in understanding what works for patients and why it works is, so as a cardiologist, I discovered, I had some frustration of, of course, dealing with heart failure, which is my main area of uh, clinical focus, hypertension, I just find that all of these patients are coming in with poorly controlled risk factors. So it's diabetes, it's hypertension, it's dyslipidemia. And I find myself sort of spending a lot of time talking about that. And so one time I gave um, my patient, I told them, they said, you know, every time I come in to see you, my blood pressure is high. And I, it's not always high like that at home. I said, well, how do you know? Do you measure it? They said, well, I just think it's not always high. So I, so I gave them a blood pressure monitor. I said, I want you to just measure this and, and write it down for me. And I want you to just use it all month, maybe just do it once or twice a day. And I want you to write down what you're doing. And I want you to be as active as you were. Do all the stuff that you normally do. So she came back to me. And she was so happy. She says, you know, I didn't realize that I could get my blood pressure down. I said, well, what happened? She goes, well, I went for a walk, and it was just a 30-minute walk. And when I came back, my blood pressure had dropped 15 points. So this was like a huge revelation to her. 
But that also was an important thing that I learned. She felt now that she has some way to control what happens. So she knows that there's some activity she does that would actually affect her blood pressure. She didn't know that before because she was not monitoring. So some of that led really to the past to come up with this uh, technology. What it basically is, is there's an algorithm that's programmed in originally on just a laptop and computer and now it's, uh, it's on a smartphone. Um, and when we first uh, had the patent out and put it out there, they were running clinical studies, and of course I w I'm not involved with the study, so I did not know that someone had put my mom in the research study. So the, and you'll see some of the data from the, the group that she participated in. But bottom line is I came home one day from work, and she was, so she was diagnosed with diabetes. And this woman who's a nurse and has really been like a go-getter, very active, she went into like some significant depression. And I didn't know what to do. I mean, I just kept telling her, you know, you're going to get a hold of this. It's really a long-term thing. And she was not really, it wasn't resonating. And one day I came home, she was excited. And she said, I said, what's going on? She says, Frankie came. I said, who's Frankie? She says, Frankie's my health coach. I said, oh, really? What did Frankie say? She goes, well, Frankie said, if I get orange or yellow on my blood pressure or red, it's bad. So I must always be green. And I said, oh, that's good. And then I said, let me see what it is. And she goes, oh, well, that's not so good. It's 130. I said, mom, 130 is not much different from 128. She goes, no, Frankie said. I said, mom, I helped design this algorithm. I know what I'm talking about. She goes, no, Frankie said. So bottom line, she had this health coach. They worked together. The, Frankie loved the fact that she did a lot of uh, smoothies and so on. She likes doing recipes. They both, Frankie's husband has diabetes, but Frankie's not diabetic. But so they basically found some common ground working together. And I tell you, this seemed to make a big difference with my mom. And so this is N of 1. This is that my N equals me stuff that I'm talking about, but there's other data behind it. I'll show you it shortly. But basically, she wound up losing 25 pounds. She still walks through the five miles a day. She told me yesterday, she says, I'm getting ready to go to clinic. And she says, oh, I'm sorry. I meant to say I'm going to the senior center. I said, I know that's your clinic. Because that's like a, that's the schedule for her that she keeps. As I said, her A1C now low. Blood pressure, just on two medicines. She's off metformin. So to me, that's what's possible. Obviously, everybody's not going to be as like this because she's, she's a pretty driven woman. But I'm, I was just impressed with it. And I have begun to just have a lot of respect for the whole notion of what happens with us, what happens with our brain, what happens with things we think we cannot do versus things we really have not tested. And when shown and empowered that we can do, we do it well. I think the example in her case, I think Frankie helped her see something that she hadn't thought she was capable of doing, getting herself to a certain goal. I think my patient who got the blood pressure monitor, she saw something she didn't think she, she had the capability to, to, to accomplish. So for those who are neuro neuroscientists like Dr. Friedlander, I think they probably know this already, but for some of us, it's all new. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because I so sort of put this together to allow me to sort of pretend to have some neuroscience behind my work. And then when I have a neuro real neuroscientist sitting in the audience, I said, okay, you know what? I need to just get off this topic because they'll, they'll just find me out. But the bottom line here is clearly we're all responding to various stimuli and it's influencing some of our impulses, some of our motivations, and that went into some of the work that we've done in the behavior space. And again, I think this is sort of uh, not exactly necessary now, but one of the things that I want to talk about is this whole issue of Connecting capability, motivation, opportunity, and behavior. It's what we call a COMB system of behavior analysis and behavior change. And this is the theory that we've used for some of the technology that we've put out there and are seem to be testing it and it seems to be working based on what we're getting from patients. 
The interesting thing about the wheel um, a format of what's called the behavior change wheel here is the fact that a lot of what we're doing, while that sort of, um, there's some enablers there, sometimes it is possible to have significant training. Obviously, we don't necessarily want coercion, uh, but it is, it is possible to incentivize individuals with both education, training, persuasion, but how much of that actually works depending on how deeply ingrained the, the behavior is. And for us, we're finding that showing people some visual image makes a difference. So this brings me, so this is where my uh, mom was able to participate, un unknown to me. So what you're looking at here is uh, the project that we, uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Pimo, implemented with NIH funding. She basically went into a community called Big Bethel AME Church, is the oldest African-American church in Atlanta. Very historic, but they had a significant organization in the sense that this gentleman here is a health coach. Uh, he's a member of the health and welfare ministry. So we trained him as a health coach for the church. And this is a patient with diabetes. And what you're looking at here is a kiosk that basically has our technology with the curriculum uploaded. So they basically would have a consultation. Right there, it's a private room, and you see there's a privacy screen, so you really can't see it. So the HIPAA uh, protection was there. But interestingly, she felt comfortable having this interaction with him. We were able to study about 150 uh, patients in the church setting, and I'll show you the data in a little bit. In the same, um, in the same study, they, they looked at three primary care practices as well, so a total of 300 people. And I'll tell you in a little bit how the church setting was superior, but one of the pictures that I want you to take away is just keep this in the back of your mind, because you're looking at this. I think this has a lot to do with why we found what we found, just the fact that there was trust, there was, that she was not afraid to share what was going on, and he had the time to give to her. He was not necessarily stiff, and so it was a very relaxed uh, interaction. And so um, the data there, were based on uh, what, what Dr. Pimo called e-health equity, uh, she thought this was a good model for getting minority patients uh, engaged. And as I said, this was based on uh, the theory based on based behavior change. So in this particular case, Health360X, uh, as a patient-centered consumer health information technology, incorporates constructs from the supportive models of accountability and what we're calling, what is known, now we, we're calling, we did not design the Combi system, but we adapted it for the technology. The intervention elements here include education, monitoring with tailored in the moment feedback, there's also persuasion, there's enablement and incentives, and depending on the individual, the coach's involvement drove engagement because they were able to create accountability, but that also was significantly enhanced by the bonding and the legitimacy that they felt uh, was going on. Let me point out here that we have learned some lessons along the way. So we took this model, and I'll show you the data just from this model in a little bit, but we, when we, they, basically the Atlanta community lit up, they wanted to know, they put it on the radio, and they talked about, they put it actually, I'm sorry, on TV, and so the city of Atlanta said, you know, we've got lots of diabetics in our, in our workplace, we would like you to bring this technology to us. So we were happy, we thought, oh good, all those people in the city of Atlanta went over to the city of Atlanta. And some of you may know the answer to this, especially those of you involved in neuroscience and be, uh, behavior. Well, the health coaches, we trained the health coaches from the community, but in this case, we brought the health coach because we didn't think people would want to tell anybody in their work environment about their health care. But they did not participate as much. And we wondered why. The only conclusion we could come to was people didn't know how to trust in the work setting, and they weren't sure that whatever they say would not be used against them. So again, while this is, as you'll see, the data was quite exciting, if there's no bond or legitimacy for some reason, it might not work. So this is a conceptual framework. Basically, the technology, in this case with diabetes, we worked with the uh, American Association of Diabetes Educators 
So we were able to embed their tried curriculum into the technology. And as you can see, the, the color dial the, that goes green, yellow, just simplifies the feedback so people just know. And as you can see, someone like my mom was pretty much focused on that feedback. We also do iStory, so people need to be able to share what they're learning, and we put people in a almost like a Facebook type of environment, so each coach has about 10 or 12 participants, and they can go into online community and share what they're learning. Um, and there's engagement uh, as a result of that process. And one of the things that we've um, we determined is that we were able to provide, help them with capability, obviously some motivation, and we think that led to the behavior change. So that's the conceptual framework. But coming back to the data, as I said, there were about 300 people that participated. Uh, so there were three primary care practices in Big Bethel AME Church, which was, again, independent. They didn't go to any healthcare system to get the delivery, as I shared. And this was pretty standard in terms of diabetics uh, demographics. So as you can see, they were older. Um, and two-thirds of them had been diabetic for more than five years, and they were pretty uh, obese. And again, this is uh, consistent. To, um, three quarters were women. And in general, um, this is um, the data that we found. So over time, there was significant reduction. So I should mention here that the coaching was only for 12 weeks, and then the individuals were basically monitored and data was collected, but they no longer had coaching because the coaching side of it was the expensive side. Um, and then 52 weeks later, they, they were, they, we drew down the data again. And what was interesting was the maintenance of the data even after the coaching stopped. This was for systolic blood pressure. And similarly for blood glucose and subsequently also A1C, um, there was significant benefit that carried through even beyond coaching. And the other thing that was quite surprising was physical activity. So the way the physical activity was, was tested here was everybody got a pedometer, but to get the pedometer, they were calibrated based on their stride. So it was personalized. So we found out that sometimes people would shake pedometer just to get activity. So. <laughs> So they couldn't, they couldn't game the system that way. So this was actual walking. Um, and it seemed like they maintained um, at least uh, the number of miles work, walked uh, over time. And so we really wanted to know uh, in, in, if we were to try to replicate this, what could be some of the potential barriers. And the way we gauged usage is we, we people, the, 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 the curriculum was such that if people identified a problem, they were directed to a place to find a solution like, we say, talk to your health coach about your diet or pull down the curriculum to look at your activity level. So there were just some pointers. So if people were truly using it well, they will spend time, there'll be minutes spent and that the technology was ref reflecting that. So if they quickly got off, then that means they didn't really spend any time. So. It didn't seem to matter how old they were. As you can see, the, the, the age uh, church house, there was no statistical difference in usage. The majority were black, but they still uh, run the analysis here. Um, education level, it didn't seem to matter in terms of uh, whether they had less than high school or more in some college. Whether they owned a computer or not didn't matter. And again, as I said, we put the, um, the kiosk in. so. Those that were in doctor's offices had access to the kiosk, and the others also had access at the Big Bethel AME Church. And whether they had uh, initial ability to use the computer but got trained through the health coach, it, was, it didn't seem to matter. There was no difference with that. I should mention here that um, in the primary care practices, it was the, um, the medical assistants that were trained as coaches. And again, that was not perfect because the primary care doctors still had the throughput of having to see however many, 25, 30 patients a day. Medical assistants were busy. They really didn't, the primary care practices, we had more mixed results, but definitely two of the practices did very well. One practice was a little bit more like they went back up by 52 weeks. So again, I think this is not going to work all the time, but the biggest thing we're learning is You've got to put in the time, and the folks have to identify with what's going on. 
So what was the barrier that we found? This is actually very important from the standpoint of where we're trying to go next. Um, if people feel anxious about their ability to use the internet, they were not there for long, surprise, surprise, and that was statistically significant. If they felt uncomfortable about putting their health information on the internet, this was hugely statistically significant. So this was a problem, and again, as we go toward technology, I think we need to spend some time uh, making sure patients understand that. So basically, as a result of this, we really feel like it is possible to engage older African Americans in technology, and, but there needs to be that really secret sauce, which is a coaching model that allows them to fully engage. But we also uh, determined based on this that if they had issues with internet security or their data security, that needs to be addressed up front. And so we spend a lot of time helping them to understand that they are the holder of this data, especially now that they are on a mobile platform and the password and for this particular um, uh, initiative that we're doing with the ACO, which I'll show you in just a couple of slides, uh, we're t we spend a lot of time encouraging people to understand that their phone is an important data risk if it's not secure. So this is what it looks like overall in terms of what people now have access to. Um, and we are still, uh, not me personally because I can't do the research because of my uh, conflict, but they're out there being tested with, uh, at Morehouse School of Medicine with investigators uh, using this, and we're also trying to get some uh, SBIR funding with it. So I should just point out that this is our, um, just a little summary of the data from our ACO. I'm not really meaning for you to note all of that down. But more to point out that we have a very high risk ACO. If you look at the hierarchical risk here, regardless of the disease in question, our ACO has a higher um, hierarchical risk compared to other medical, uh, Medicare shared savings ACO around the country. So the accountable care organization is really a way that Medicare or CMS is using to try to reduce costs. So if you are able to reduce costs and deliver good quality, which they do that measurement, you're able to share savings. They take half of it though. Um, so I just wanna segue in the closing uh, minutes before we open it up for question to something that I think uh, we all really need to um, highlight and emphasize. So the whole notion of precision medicine, so one of my, um, the family medicine um, chair that I met with earlier just asked me, he wanted to know how I'm able to hold these two things in my head at the same time, precision medicine and yet public things. So I'll just tell you how, and, and again, this is based on research that we found. And so when President Barack Obama back in uh, 2015 uh, talked about this, he was talking about the precision medicine initiative that's now called the All of Us uh, program. And to me, the way I integrate this is this notion that in order for us to get to that, um, everybody understanding their own role in care, but also that whole personalization, which is democratization with N equals me, uh, the issue here is we need to have a framework that's not only participatory, but personalized and preventive, and I believe with some more opportunity for lots and lots of data points, not just with the genome, but also with some of the uh, phenotypes that we gather, there's an opportunity for prediction, but we're not there yet, obviously. And so this is that two things that I hold in my brain at the same time, so I'm just gonna explain that. So again, this is bringing individuals who are otherwise normal to the clinical research center. They're all, uh, there's, uh, the, these guys here are obese, and these guys here are lean. And the whole idea of this study, Dr. Pima really wanted to understand the issue of, is, it, is, it, um, is there any impact on endothelial progenitor cells? And so they took that and cultured the progenitor cells and did some bioinformatics to actually look at what's expressed, overexpressed or underexpressed. And again, it's not 100% each time, but you can see just very broadly, there's a significant overexpression here. These happen to be the inflammatory uh, markers, genes that, um, that highlight inflammation. And over here, just this underexpression in obese individuals. For these are sort of immune, uh, suppressed immunity, as well as prone to infections, obviously. 
and look at the, the, the lean individuals, very clearly very heightened, uh, appropriate, I guess, uh, immune response, and um, just not, not heightened as far as the inflammatory response. So, you know, I use this in my communication with patients because somehow patients can see this and they get it. And so um, we then communicate with them that these are progenitor cells. And that means that if you, are, if, you, if you as an individual are experiencing significant alterations in your transcriptome at this point with significant gene expression that's not normal because you have downregulation that leads to infections and cancer of the immune system, whereas pro-inflammatory markers that could lead to vascular dysfunction, as we know, um, actually does as far as atherosclerosis. And I tell my patients that, you know, this is sort of what we mean by epigenetics, and I explain that epigenetics means something in your environment that sort of becomes a part of your genome at some point, and if it's in your progenitor cell, that means it's possible that it could get translated to your offspring, and people just pay attention at that point. Because it's one thing if I have the disease, it's something else if I'm going to make it harder for my child to be normal, but I'll make it easier for them to be obese or whatever. So that's interesting. Anyway, so for, to round this out, I'm going to now um, talk a little bit about our community advisory board and how we use them, and I, hopefully that's helpful as you think about your efforts to engage uh, community in your research. So this guy is Jason Owen. He's the, at that time, he was the president of our community advisory board. Um, and, and they'll go with us out into the community. I took him with me when I went up to the radio to talk about obesity, talk about some of that work that I just shared that's happening at the research center. And his voice really is very different from my voice. And that's the other thing to keep in mind is when you're going out into a community, someone else asked me that question. I think it was a family practice chair. It's important to go to the community with some of understanding what they need, but also understanding that it's not really just about you and your research. If you just go there and say, you know, I am just want to collect some samples and then you're gone and you never go back and they don't see you unless when you want to get the research data, they basically will no longer trust you to come back. I mean, they'll, they'll welcome you, but it's a different level of welcome. So just to show you, so this is something we invest a lot of time and effort in. The Community Advisory Board, they are all members of the community. They have a charter. We fund them to come to the center to have their meetings. Uh, this is everyone. This is actually uh, Dr. Pimu, who's, uh, she leads them, and she, this is some of our research. But so we've got pastors here. We've got retired nurses. We've got people in technology. Uh, we've got people who are still actively working. And so they're a good representation of our community. And they go out and promote research with us. They participate in research. They review our research protocols and say, okay, this makes sense. And sometimes they tell us what maybe doesn't make sense from the standpoint of the community. And we have to pay attention because we've learned that they know what they're talking about. So this is when they went hiking. So again, we try to make sure the activities make sense based on what they want to do. And so we also have a mobile research unit that goes out in, um, this has this thing that says medical miracles start with research. One of my staff came up with that and it's, it's sort of, it didn't go viral, I guess, but it's very popular. Um, and this is what happens when we go out and we go all across the state of Georgia and actually, actually one time we went to Birmingham, we're able to sort of set out and the nurses, everybody get together, we do, we, um, there's uh, inside we have a treadmill and some other things. We have lab uh, drawing station. So we're able to do the research that's needed, which is very helpful to our team because now um, uh, we actually now have one of the all of us precision medicine initiatives at Morehouse School of Medicine. It is a collaboration with uh, three institutions, University of Miami, um, University of Florida, Gainesville, Emory and Morehouse School of Medicine. And again, the focus here is going to be allowing, bringing in more African Americans and Hispanics to the overall cohort. And that's some of uh, the activity um, going up to Washington with the chief engagement officer who's shown there in the middle, Dr. Dara Richardson. I just want to uh, close this out with this uh, image here because I want to tell you guys in closing a little bit, this is a good bit of how I spend my time. Friedlander mentioned that um, principal investigator of a network. This, this is a network of uh, now 21 institutions, and these are the institutions shown here. 
And these um, institutions are funded by NIH to do research, and the research is across the spectrum. So you got basic scientists, you got clinicians, and you got population researchers. Um, and the reason I have this up here, obviously, we run these conferences, but at this most recent conference um, in October, Dr. Uh, Francis Collins uh, said, you know, the, he, they at NIH looked at the RCMI community as a brain trust to help develop novel solutions on health disparities. And I like that, but I'd like them to put more money into that. Um, so some of the, I think the opportunity is, as a result of these uh, initiatives, I'm looking forward to collaborating some more. And I know our medical uh, students are excited about some of the work that involve community engagement. So hopefully we'll have that opportunity to do that. And, and I just want to close by really acknowledging a number of individuals. Dr. Pimu has done a lot of the work that I cited here. Um, she's a faculty. She's really now a professor. And I should, excuse me, I should actually mention here a little bit, not really bragging, but I know we talked about the MSCR. So we started a program called the Master of Science in Clinical Research back in 2002 at Morehouse. And she was one of the first graduates. And when she started, she was just finished residency assistant professor. And she's a full professor, and she's been a full professor now for over five years. So it has helped us retain good faculty. But it's also helped those faculty advance their careers. And again, um, I know we were talking about this earlier as potential opportunity. As I said, the Community Advisory Board, uh, we are part of the Georgia CTSA now, and it helps us with some of these, as I said, uh, training programs um, and, and so on. And of course, I should always thank my patients. I still do half-day work, clinical work at Morehouse Healthcare, and I'm grateful for that. So I thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Very, very good question. I think, first of all, there's a general health system thing, the model we have, which is very paternalistic in the sense that people come into the doctor's office wanting things to be done to them and for them. There's not a notion that they have any role in their care. And I think in the health system, we actually sort of make that go on, and it's an ongoing thing. So reversing that a little bit and make, like I said, it's in the doing. People actually have to get that self-efficacy. I took out some of the slides here because I didn't want it to be too long. One of the things we learned, like there was a diabetic, she was just really obese woman, and she was, cr we brought them back to the center, and that was when I got to actually talk to them to just get their feedback on after all these months of, of being a part of this. She was crying. She said, I didn't think anybody cared enough to take the time to work with me. Yes, people know when you spend five minutes and shoo them out the door versus just say, okay, go, go talk to the next, uh, just go talk to the out, whatever, the, um, the outreach nurse. And there's nothing wrong with the outreach nurse, but it makes a difference if they're hearing it from their clinician. Um, so that's what I think is, those are the two big barriers, is actually people's perception of what it is they can do and also people's expectation that the health system and the health team have the whole responsibility and that they don't know enough to contribute. So that's, I think that's part of how, why this works is um, they're seeing that they're actually able to be empowered. And that, those were um, two of the major themes we found was empowerment, actually three, empowerment, engagement, and access their ability, that help their ability. Does that help? Um, so when you looked at the access, did you look at access to fitness facilities or food deserts or anything like that? 
So that's a very another good question. So we basically both downtown Atlanta in the southwest where Morehouse School of Medicine is, it's the classic food desert. I mean, when I first got there, I would just drive up and down. I mean, you know, you see churches fried chicken and whatever the other one is. and But, you know, you don't really see there's no fresh food. So th there's definitely food desert there. Um, and one of the other research, one of my uh, nutritionists at the research center, what, when we did another research, we actually took people to the grocery store. And she showed them how to shop, how to read labels. And, it's, and, and the other thing that a lot of questions that they were asking was, I really don't understand about food and what's the, the right foods. And I think sometimes we take some things for granted, but it's important to just, like I said, as you talk to them, see where it is they have a need so they don't feel like it's a deficiency. It's a need and not a deficiency. It becomes a deficiency if it doesn't get supported and enabled. And so that's the first thing to make them know nothing is out of bounds. We just want to know what your barriers are. So yes, there were food deserts. We didn't build it into this particular project because we already had discovered that earlier on. Yes. Yeah, right. Right. So actually, the inter again, another good question. So for, when I say preventive medicine, because of my cardiology, there's actually a space for preventive cardiology, which is what I, I call myself doing sometimes. So when people come in, and I'm paying a lot of attention to the risk factors. So I'm not just writing them a prescription for statin or blood pressure medicine. I'm really spending a lot of time understanding, are they truly taking those medicines? Because a lot of the times you find out that either they don't know exactly what they're taking or somebody stopped something somewhere. So it's, the picture is not clear. And it's, sometimes it's burdensome because they, they allow you 15 minutes per patient encounter and by the time the patient talks about what they need and by the time you get to look at the meds, a lot of time has gone by. So what we do now with the ACO, they, they have the patients bring sort of what they've gathered, so that helps them. The medicines is on there in their documentation, and we're able to go directly to questions that they have. Um, so I, I view preventive cardiology as really looking at all the things while the patient is in there with a disease or a diagnosis, looking at all the risk factors that you could modulate as a clinician with or without drugs. And no one leaves, so David Satcher, who's at Morehouse School of Medicine and was Surgeon General, when he was Surgeon General, he used to write a prescription for health, for people. Um, and they'd go out with this little card, and evidently that's pretty powerful in terms of people taking something away. So. I now put that as part of my EMR, the after visit notes. I, in my own words, I, I put it down. I said, we talked about this, and we talked about this, and I want you to walk more. And even though everybody else has told them that, coming from me seems to have you know, weight because they know my patients tell me before I come back to see you, I start exercising, I start eating better because I know you're going to ask me. <laughs> so. That's, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So based on your data, um, how does patient adherence kind of highlight some of the health disparities? Very good question. So it is just, adherence is just a, a whole problem for our healthcare system. A lot of patients, when they come to see you as a new patient, sometimes they have a suitcase. Because different doctors are writing stuff in... Nobody, we all think they're not taking what they have, so you put a new one in, and when you really start talking to patients, sometimes they have stopped some of the old ones, but you're thinking you're adding new ones. So non-compliance or lack of adherence is a big problem. And there's been a lot of focus now with the Affordable Care Act, and that's the same thing for prevention with the Affordable Care Act, just a little bit of focus to try to bring that into the forefront. And so people have to do what's called medication reconciliation. 
So when you look at your chart, and in fact, when I try to do other things, it's going, there's an outside medication. Go back and look and see what you think. Of course, we find ways to game it. No, I did not say that. Um, but the point is, you're supposed to go back and ask the, the nurse first does that, and then they expect the doctor to do that as well. And then when they're leaving, you do that. But I still think there's a bit of a gap because unless patients know this is a beta blocker, because they will ask you, is it the red pill, is it the green pill? Then you're not really sure because they're different colors depending on what batch they're prescribing. So I don't think we've solved the problem yet, but I think there's capacity to solve it. You can imagine if we get to the point where, since patients have cell phones, if you can just take a picture of their meds and they'll know when they take the medication, they align it with the dose. I think things will get better, but I also think just pausing to ask them, what are you taking? If you're not taking, why are you not taking? And now make sure you, they know it's, I'm not trying to be mad at you. I just need to know because if I don't know, I'm prescribing stuff and it's just going to make you sick because we're piling on stuff. So, but that takes time. Yeah, you guys will ask all good questions. Um, so it's a challenge. So sometimes, though, people make assumptions, right? Like when Dr. Pimo wrote that health equity, people assume that older African-American women will not touch technology. They do have a challenge, as you can see, the few people that we saw that had a, you know, trouble with the internet. But if you take the time to train, so access to technology is a challenge, but there is some opportunity out there. Some people actually, it's not just about the smartphone, in case you don't have smartphone. We encourage people to use a library, to use other resources, but it's a, it's a step. For example, as a, as a result of the Affordable Care Act, there's a lot of, the, the government put a lot of money into adopting EMR. And as a part of that adoption, they encourage people to have what's called patient portals, so the patients will be able to get in from home and check into their care. Well, people are doing that, but the people are doing that are people like me and you. The people you really want to do that, that group that's accounting for the large disparity, they have a challenge. So I think we have not yet perfected it to say, okay, for this visit, we're just going to look, at, have you enter, go into my chart and I need to see that you're using it properly and see, do you have any questions? That we're just telling them, have you signed on my chart? And the patient will go, I decline. And then, okay, everybody goes, yeah, they decline. So it's just the first step has been made, but I think we need more steps, including working with them on, with whatever technology you have. And that, in this case, just your EMR and the ability to go into their portal, the patient portal, to look at stuff for themselves. So it's a, it's a step, but we've got a long way to go. <laughs> and I'll put it under the rubric of uh, uh, placebo effect. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So particularly in what you were showing us earlier on, including somebody coming to the house or taking blood pressure, and the interactions with the individual health um, counselors right. uh, that you had, I could imagine, and I don't mean to demean the placebo effect, right. I'm a strong believer in right. the power and the science of the placebo effect, uh -huh. but nonetheless it could be a very important part and dif difference between individual healthcare providers. Is that part of the study? Mm -hmm. in any way that you control for or looking at differences? Right, so very good question. <laughs> um, no, we did not control for the placebo effect, other than just because we felt each person was their own control. We got the baseline and then subsequently, but obviously it's not the most rigorous. And I think that from when you get to the point of prescribing the therapy beyond our clinical studies, that there is a study going on now with the technology where they're actually randomizing people. Um, and that is, and they're getting biomarkers and doing other things. So I don't know that we'll completely remove placebo effect, but I think we're at least looking to see which is truly based on the fact that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Then my thing though is at the end of the day, whether or not it's a placebo effect, we know there's certain behaviors that we want, right? So if they're doing those behaviors, I'm fine. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Yeah. So, okay, if there are further questions, please join me again in thanking Dr. Felix. Thank you. Thank you.